Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Richard Nixon Presidential Library. My name is Jonathan Mavroidis. Um, before we introduce our guest speaker this evening, I just wanted to let you all know that uh, down the hall is a special new exhibit, um, which is accessible from 9 to 5, or I'm sorry, 10, 10 to 5 p.m. Um, Monday uh, through Saturday, and then 11 a.m. on 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. on Sunday. It's about the 50th anniversary of 1968, and I urge you to check it out. It's called Vote Like Your Whole World Depended on It. Um, it's about that tumultuous year and the waves of social change amidst all, and amidst all that, Richard Nixon became president of the United States. Uh, it's filled with media at the time, um, and you can actually sit in a 1960s living room um, where you can drop in a Simon and Garfunkel LP or whatever, what other uh, 1960s favorite. Uh, you'd like, um, and you can also take it in the evening news with Walter Cronkite. So I urge you all that check it out. It's a um, very interesting new exhibit. Now onto our distinguished speaker this evening. He is the rare combination of businessman, entrepreneur, and scholar. Hendrik Hank Meyer is the executive chairman of Meyer Inc., one of the largest supermarket chains serving the Midwest. It's ranked near the top list of, for, of, of the Forbes, uh, America's largest private companies. He joined his family business at age 11 as a grocery clerk, and then he went on to the University of Michigan and then became a reporter and later editor of a Michigan newspaper. He rejoined his family business as assistant advertising director and rose to become its CEO. In 1984, he published Thrifty Years, a biography of Meyer founder and his grandfather, also named Hendrick Meyer. And he's, also this, and he's also the author of a new book. It's called Arthur Vandenberg, The Man in the Middle of the American Century. The subject of Meyer's new book is also the descendant of Dutch immigrants. Um, he's also a Michigan native and also started his career as a journalist. According to the author, Senator Arthur Vandenberg put his country ahead of party, especially at such a critical time in the country's history in the 1930s and 40s. He started as an isolationist at the onset of World War II, but recognized the need for unity and worked across the, uh, work across the aisle to build a bipartisan international consensus that established the Marshall Plan, the United Nations, and NATO. This is the, this is the political environment in which Richard Nixon started his career in 1947 in Washington. He was undoubtedly influenced by this old elder statesman as he himself, as he himself was um, became a uh, internationalist, uh, was a self-avowed internationalist. Of, Arthur, of, Hendrick, of Mr. Meyer's new book, Henry Kissinger says, Meyer's engaging biography traces Vandenberg's evolution from a young politician drawn toward isolationism to a decisive proponent of the United Nations and an enduring American world role. Meyer, Meyer has introduced an affecting human portrait of a public servant who came to symbolize the bipartisan pursuit of the national interest and a more peaceful world. Ladies and gentlemen, with that, Hank Meyer. Thank you, Jonathan. Good evening, everyone. Uh, this, is, this is just a tremendous yeah. treat. I've, I'm fortunate to have some old friends in the audience and, and my first time at the Nixon Library and um, just it's a singular pleasure, and I'm grateful to the Foundation for this opportunity. Uh, this year marks the 70th anniversary of the Marshall Plan, in which a freshman's, freshman congressman from Whittier championed in the House of Representatives as a member of the Herder Committee, which toured devastated Europe in 1948 to better understand the need for what may be the most consequential peacetime action in the history of American foreign policy. That story of the Marshall Plan has many chapters, but one begins in, in my hometown of Grand Rapids, Michigan, with the, the local boy who made it possible. And back in 1990, when I began researching this book, if you walk down the street of Grand Rapids, Michigan, and ask someone, who's Arthur Vandenberg? No, most people would have said, well, is he related to the jewelry store? There was one of those on Monroe Avenue in Grand Rapids. He was not. But the... Uh, it's funny how history sometimes seems to conspire to elevate some legacies and obscure others, and you could say that happened to Arthur Vandenberg. We start out today um, in a place devoted to our 37th president to start with a more familiar face, our 38th. Arthur Vandenberg was becoming a world figure in 1946 when he met a young lawyer just out of the Navy, the distinguished senator, 
with his comb over haircut and puffed up ego, was back in town only briefly, stopping by his office at the Pantland Hotel in Grand Rapids. He'd just come from a post-war peace conference in Paris, and Jerry Ford was hanging out his shingle with a local law firm. But Jerry was also the fresh face of the home front movement, a group including his father that was challenging a corrupt Republican machine that controlled state government in Michigan. Two years later, in 1948, Vandenberg was fuming over the refusal of his own hometown congressman to support his efforts to win approval of the Marshall Plan and other important legislation after World War II. And he was happy to see a challenge to the Republican incumbent. He let it be known that he was backing Jerry Ford, and Jerry Ford was forever grateful for getting his start in politics. But our story actually starts at the beginning of the 20th century when a teenager just out of high school fell under the sway of the most exciting politician of that era, Theodore Roosevelt. Arthur Vandenberg was born in 1884, the son of a harness maker who nearly went broke when Arthur was nine years old, and trying to help support the household launched young Arthur as an entrepreneur. He set up a delivery business with other boys, pushing carts of shoes from a factory to the railroad station. And he was something of a prodigy in government studies. He claimed he'd been reading the congressional record since he was 14. I have no evidence to support that, but none to contradict it either. And after his first, his first job after graduating from high school was working at a biscuit factory in downtown, but he was fired the day he left his desk to join a campaign parade for the charismatic young governor of New York, Teddy Roosevelt, who came to town in the fall of 1900 as a candidate for vice president on the ticket with William McKinley. He soon got a job. He was both fired and he was inspired because he soon got a job as a reporter for the Grand Rapids Herald, where he quickly became the paper's most prolific correspondent. He covered the police beat and city hall. His first byline, and he was still 16 years old, came a few weeks later with a full page story on the Electoral College. And he was a regular Republican when the city and the state and really much of the country outside the South was mostly Republican. He was not yet 22 when the longtime editor of the Herald died and the paper's re owner, Republican Senator William Alden Smith, chiefly known, by the way, for presiding over the Titanic hearings, tapped him to be editor. And he married his high school sweetheart but in 1917, at the age of 33, she died, leaving him as a single parent with three small children. Soon after, he reconnected with a woman he'd met during his brief year at the University of Michigan. Hazel Vandenberg was writing advertising for a Detroit department store when their courtship began, and later that year they were married. After World War I, Vandenberg fought for reservations to Senate approval of American membership in the new League of Nations but he tried to find a compromise between supporters of President Woodrow Wilson, who refused to make any changes to the League Covenant that he'd negotiated at the Palace of Versailles in Paris, and his opponents, led by the Republican Chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, Henry Cabot Lodge. Vandenberg sent Lodge his editorials. He was always trying to impress politicians with what he was writing, and in reply to one, Lodge wrote back, I'm going to steal your, one of your lines. Unshared idealism is a menace. And Vandenberg also wrote speeches for presidential candidate Warren Harding, and then three books inspired by his hero, Alexander Hamilton. Uh, he wrote three books. None of them are very good. None of them were optioned for theatrical or motion picture production. Um, but he also, he called the first one Trail of a Tradition, Tracing the Story of American Foreign Policy, and it had a subtitle that he would never back away from. It's hard to read, but isolationism, not internationalism, is the indispensable bulwark, or excuse me, nationalism, not internationalism, is the indispensable bulwark of American independence. And from his office in the new Herald building overlooking the city's Veterans Park, the editor and publisher was making something of a name for himself on the national stage. He was also preparing to chase his dream and run for the United States Senate in 1928 when the incumbent Democrat died and he was appointed to the seat. So expectations were very high when Arthur and Hazel arrived in Washington just in time for the White House Easter egg hunt hosted by President Coolidge and he was eager to work with the new president elected that fall, Herbert Hoover, 
President Hoover's brand of what might be called modern conservatism appealed to the freshman senator. And Vandenberg saw a role for himself as a broker between the GOP's major factions then, the largely East Coast old guard and the mostly Western band of progressives. And this mix was a particular challenge for the new president, Hoover, who had never held elective office, never been in Congress, didn't know how to work with the legislature. And though he was a brilliant engineer and administrator, Hoover struggled to corral his Republican majority, struggled to communicate with the progressive leader, William Bora of Idaho, who quickly became a mentor for Vandenberg. So Hoover Vett lacked finesse, to say the least, in working with Congress. And then the stock market crashed in 1929, and that doomed his presidency. Vandenberg next tries to work with Franklin Roosevelt after FDR's landslide victory in 1932. He's a savvy politician in a state that's turning purple. He's also ready in a time of national emergency to cooperate with the Democratic administration. So he supports some of the early New Deal remedies for a crippled economy. And he has one of his own, savings deposit insurance to protect small depositors and save the nation's banks. Hoover had fought him on this and FDR does too. The Wall Street banks and FDR, of course, is the former governor of New York and a New Yorker, worried that, that insuring deposits in weak banks might pull down the stronger ones. But Vandenberg had the votes in the Senate, and a new law created the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, the FDIC. Now, Roosevelt comes to see the value of that, and much to Vandenberg's chagrin, is all too happy to claim credit for what may have been the most successful of all New Deal legislation but it was the brainchild of Arthur Vandenberg. As the reach of federal power grew, however, Vandenberg tried to draw a good Republican distinction between being social-minded and socialistic, and he broke with Roosevelt over executive rulemaking that he regarded as too intrusive, and he was a real vigilante when he thought the New Deal was overstepping the Constitution, and he certainly couldn't abide Roosevelt's attempt to tinker with the Supreme Court and enlarge it because it had rejected some of the president's legislation. And this hardening of Vandenberg's opposition to FDR was coinciding with world events that posed new dangers. The rise of Hitler in Germany and Mussolini in Italy threatened peace in Europe, and the Japanese war cabinet had ordered an invasion of China. In the face of threats around the globe, Vandenberg fell back on what was for him a first principle. He recalled Washington's farewell address, written by his hero, Alexander Hamilton, warning the young republic to avoid taking sides when European powers collide. Let there be no entangling alliances, Washington warned, and to Vandenberg that meant one thing, American neutrality. As war clouds gathered over Europe, it was neutrality that he preached. And there are a few people in this audience who may remember the Ionia Free Fair in Michigan with some good Republican element, elephants looking over his shoulder. Again and again, Vandenberg led the Senate isolationists who stymied Roosevelt's attempts to, to aid the European democracies. In September 1939, however, debates about neutrality took on a new urgency when German bombers filled the skies over Warsaw and German tanks rolled into Poland. On a national radio hookup broadcast from a baseball field in Grand Rapids, Vandenberg declared, this is not our war. And before it became our war, with the surprise attack on Pearl Harbor, he led the band of isolationists, mostly Republican, but some Democrats too, who fought Roosevelt every step of the way. They distrusted his every move, fearing that American boys would be pulled into combat in another distant war. The isolationists fought and lost to a fight to keep the arms embargo in the 1937 Neutrality Act that Vandenberg had helped create. They fought and lost to fight over the Lend-Lease deal, giving destroyers to the British Navy. Vandenberg was their nemesis, and Arthur Vandenberg was their, excuse me, Roosevelt was their nemesis, and Vandenberg was their organizing spirit. If you've seen that new movie about Winston Churchill, Darkest Hour, you may recall the phone call in there, and of course it's made up, but the phone call that Churchill makes to, to Roosevelt pleading for the release of weapons that the British had ordered. Well, it was Arthur Vandenberg who was leading the effort to prevent that from happening. Back in 1936, Vandenberg had avoided Candace, Kansas Governor Alf Landon's attempt to draft him as his vice presidential running mate. Smart move, 
FDR carried every state except Maine and Vermont. But in the run up to 1940, Vandenberg was viewed as the leading candidate for the Republican, or a leading candidate for the Republican nomination. In fact, in 1938, the FBI opened an office in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and when the agent sent there was asked about his new assignment, he said he'd been sent to keep an eye on Arthur Vandenberg. And I was told this by an elderly um, former newspaper reporter in Grand Rapids and had only a single source for it. Um, but I trusted the source, but it was just the single source. And then just a couple of months ago, way after the book came out, I was talking to an FBI agent who had retired from the Grand Rapids office, and he was explaining the structure of that organization, which some of you may know, I didn't. He said, well, there's 56 like district offices around the country in all the major metro areas. So San Diego, LA, San Francisco are going to have offices that report in directly to, um, to uh, Washington. And then there are smaller district offices that report to the, through those divisional offices. So in the case of Grand Rapids, there would be offices in, in Detroit and Chicago, but Grand Rapids would report through one of those. And, and my FBI acquaintance said, well, you know, my colleagues and I could never, this, so this explains something. My colleagues and I could never figure out why when the Grand Rapids office was set up, it was a divisional office reporting in directly to the director, which is kind of goofy. In 1938, the depression's still underway. Grand Rapids is not a hotbed of organized crime, and yet they're reporting directly to J. Edgar Hoover. So if, for those of us who, who might worry that the FBI is becoming political, um, nothing new there. Um, <laughs> but the, um, when in, in 1940, Vandenberg and his isolationist colleague, Robert Taft, Vandenberg on the right, Taft on the left, were swept aside along with their traditional isolationist point of view by a charismatic lawyer, Wendell Wilkie, whose willingness to intervene in Europe nearly matched Roosevelt's. And then Pearl Harbor made Vandenberg's isolationism look obsolete, and America was soon all in, in a global war. As the war began to turn in favor of the Allies, who were dubbed by Roosevelt the United Nations, Republicans faced two big questions. One was partisan. Wendell Wilkie was what might be called today a rhino. He'd been a Democrat before he ran for the Republican nomination. He was regarded by most of the GOP establishment as an opportunistic interloper. Now any comparison to the present day might get a bit confusing. Um, and his nomination reflected a deep schism in the party, one that is still with us today between isolationists or unilateralists on the one hand and the internationalists or those who believe in broader global cooperation on the other. And if the Republicans were going to have a chance at the presidency in 1944, they felt they needed to bring these two factions together, but how would they do it? The other question on the minds of Americans of all political stripes this is in 1943, the tide of the war is turning. We've won the Battle of Midway. We're getting ready to launch the second front in Europe. What would the world look like after the war and what role should the United States play in it? Would the US retreat again as we did after World War I, back when Vandenberg's editorials faulted Wilson and the League of Nations? Now the question was whether and how nations might organize themselves to avoid future catastrophes. And Roosevelt wasn't saying. Senators and congressmen had all kinds of ideas. Bills were bubbling up in congressional committees. But FDR, and I think very appropriately, was Dr. Win the War. When Democrats in Congress tried to introduce resolutions in the House or the Senate, he quashed them. He didn't want to rock the boat or risk alienating our allies. The Soviets had designs on their neighbors. The British had an empire they hoped to reclaim. and. Besides that, Franklin Roosevelt was a one-man band in foreign policy. In fact, his State Department was often on the sidelines. When there were important missions, it was Harry Hopkins meeting with Stalin or Churchill, not the diplomats, not Cordell Hall, the Secretary of State. To answer the first question about Republican unity, the GOP called a meeting of leading elected officials, all their leading elected officials, to be held at the Grand Hotel in, on Mackinac Island in northern Michigan over Labor Day weekend, 1943. Um, 
not many of you probably have had occasion to be in northern Michigan, but the Grand Hotel likes to brag that they have the longest porch in the world. And Vandenberg is reclining there on that porch. Um, and, and not for the first time, he, as he was looking for a middle way between these two factions of the party, between the isolationists who wanted nothing more than to wash their hands of the world and bring the troops home, and many of these were his longtime friends and allies, and the Wilkie adherents who'd held varying ideas about world federalism or an international police force, a revived League of Nations. So when the Republicans came out of that meeting at the Grand with a statement they could run on and an expression of support, however mild, for some sort of world organization, that went beyond anything that Roosevelt or the Democrats had yet offered. The wonderfully ambiguous, grandly named Mackinac Charter set the stage for things to come. And this is the, that foreign policy group meeting. Vandenberg is standing and immediately to his left is uh, Robert Taft, and then further to his left to our right is uh, California Governor Earl Warren. The Vandenberg said, when I succeeded in putting 49 prima donnas together, he told Henry Luce of Time Magazine, and it certainly took one to know one, I discovered the necessary formula. For Vandenberg, compromise was almost an art form. In fact, I, I interviewed a woman some of you may have heard of named Liz Carpenter, who had been press secretary for Lady Bird Johnson and, and worked in the Johnson White House. Her first assignment as a reporter was to cover this conference when she was 22 years old, and there were there were rooms in this hotel right adjacent to that porch and she talked and it, with, with floor to ceiling windows and she talked about lying on the floor uh, next to that window and listening and, and wonderfully grandiose statement, but, but I love it. She, she's, Vandenberg would walk the various, his, his colleagues down to the far end of the porch trying to get them to arrive at a, to, to come together on this charter idea. And she said, I can still see those footsteps where isolationism ended for all time. Now, uh, that's again subject to some contesting today, but uh, it's a great image. Um, but Vandenberg was moving away from isolationism. Pearl Harbor certainly played a part. So did his nephew, Hoyt Vandenberg, an Air Force general and student of modern warfare who'd been in London for the Battle of Britain and would drop by Uncle Arthur's Connecticut Avenue apartment on a Sunday afternoon to talk strategy in the kitchen. Uh, Vandenberg's mistress, probably planted by British intelligence, probably had much less influence. It's just fun to talk about her. And by contrast, he relished the favorable press response to the Mackinac Charter as the GOP suddenly grabbed the spotlight in advancing support of what would become the United Nations. Even as he was moving in a new direction, however, it was chiefly behind the scenes. Most of the public still thought of him as the voice of isolationism. And that changed on January 10th, 1945. The Allies were winning the war, closing in on Japan, island by island, pushing across the Rhine into Germany. And a weary Roosevelt, in poorer health than anyone knew, was about to leave for the Russian resort of Yalta on the Black Sea to meet with Stalin and Churchill to talk about what to do in, as the collapse of the Third Reich do, drew near. And no longer were they talking battle strategy, now they're talking what are we going to do after the war? What about this United Nations? And Vandenberg was worried. Neither he nor his colleagues knew what the three leaders would be deciding or what deals FDR might commit to on our behalf. And it occurred to me in the last couple of months that the, this has something in common with, with the present day, perhaps. Um, the, because FDR played his card so close to his chest in foreign policy, often sidelining the State Department, uh, certainly not uh, talking with his Republican op opposition, um, he went to this meeting with Stalin with the Republicans particularly, but a lot of people wondering what's, what's, gonna go, what's going on here. And I would argue that from Truman to Obama, through Democrats and Republicans, conservatives and liberals, all the way through that question of what are these two leaders talking about and what kind of deals might be happening was never really an issue until Helsinki a few weeks ago, when once again we wonder what were they talking about? Because somehow there had always been, 
a sort of consensus around the, the, the issues at hand. But um, Vandenberg's response was to write a speech. And on January 10th, he rose in the Senate in 1945 to propose a post-war security treaty among the victorious allies to ensure that Germany would never again wage war on its neighbors. Boom, this was the Senate's leading isolationist calling for an American commitment to an entangling alliance with countries that had fought two world wars in the last three decades. It was, one correspondent said, the speech heard round the world and it was a renunciation of beliefs that he'd espoused for 25 years. When Franklin Roosevelt was asked about Vandenberg's speech, he spoke dismissively, but the White House made a hasty request for 50 copies before the president departed for Russia. And within months, the world and Vandenberg's place in it changed quickly. Roosevelt returned from Yalta knowing that he had no choice if he was to avoid Woodrow Wilson's fatal mistake with the League of Nations after World War I, other than to, to, to appoint Vandenberg, the leading Republican voice on foreign policy, as a delegate to the conference to be convened in May 1945 in San Francisco to create the United Nations. This is a picture of that first UN delegation meeting with uh, Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, Vandenberg is second from the right here, and it was Vandenberg and his Democratic counterpart who was then chairing the Foreign Relations Committee, a Texan named Tom Connolly, and the House Democrat and Republican in Foreign Affairs, and then the president of Barnard College, Virginia Gildersleeve, and a young naval commander who'd been the boy wonder governor of Minnesota, Harold Stassen. Those six people were the American delegation. This is very early April 1945, then Franklin Roosevelt dies. Vice President Truman had famously had lunch once with the president between, in, in the months between the election and Roosevelt's death. He was a neophyte in foreign affairs, although a decisive one. He quickly announced that the UN meeting would move ahead. And since Roosevelt had often worked around the State Department in crafting foreign policy, his new young Secretary of State, Edward Stettinius, was a marginal player. And Vandenberg's Democratic counterpart, Foreign Relations Chairman Connolly, was a canny old politician, but of, of limited range. And that left Vandenberg, the Republican who had come round to speak out first in favor of such a world organization, to emerge as the most influential American delegate. When it came time, to sit down with the other powers in the penthouse of the Fairmont Hotel in San Francisco to design what Vandenberg liked to call the town meeting of the world. His opinion and that of the Soviet Foreign Secretary Molotov seemed to be the ones that counted most. In fact, just as a little bit of uh, partisan trivia, this is, this is Vandenberg with his back to us. Uh, behind him is John Foster Dulles, who he brought along as his ad advisor, later Eisenhower's Secretary of State, and Nelson Rockefeller to our left, who was at that time the um, Assistant Secretary of State for Latin American Affairs. And with help from, Lat with, from Rockefeller, he made sure that the UN Charter allowed for regional security arrangements so that with the Monroe Doctrine, the US and its Latin American neighbors could have a mutual defense treaty. And he made sure there would be enough Republicans on board in the Senate to approve the charter when it landed in their laps. And here, he, this is Vandenberg signing the charter. President Truman came in for that ceremony at the far left. And President Truman needed him. After the charter was ratified, the president and asked Vandenberg and Connolly to play an unprecedented role in American diplomacy. This was before there was an ambassador to the United Nations. Uh, the first General Assembly was held in the fall of 1945 in London, and there was a four-person American delegation, Vandenberg at the left, Connolly at the right, Secretary of State Statinius in the middle, along with another face you may recognize, Eleanor Roosevelt. And it, it was sort of a wonderfully heartening moment as I, was, as I was working on this book because Vandenberg and Roosevelt had been bitter enemies and Vandenberg and Eleanor were particularly bitter because Vandenberg and a lot of Republicans viewed Eleanor as this 
ultra-liberal voice whispering in the more pragmatic FDR's ears, always pulling him further to the left, at the same time that she resented Vandenberg because he had been such an effective critic of her husband and um, defeated some of, his, some of his New Deal initiatives. And so there was no love lost between the two of them at all. They sailed together from uh, New York to Southampton, and by the time they get there, um, Vandenberg writes to his friend John Foster Dulles and says, you know, I take back everything I've said about her, and it's been plenty. And by the time they're done at the London General Assembly, she writes him a letter practically pleading with him to stay on in the U.S. delegation. And he says, you know, geez, I'd love to, but I've got to get back to my job in the Senate. But to see that come from those points of bitterness to be kind of the mutual admiration society, is, I thought, was just sort of heartening. The, um, more significantly, Vandenberg and Connolly joined the new Secretary of State who succeeded Statinius, James Burns, for conferences with foreign ministers in Paris through much of 1946 to negotiate peace treaties with countries such as Italy that had fought the war on the German side. This is in the, the those, those treaty conferences were held in the Luxembourg Palace in Paris, and this is Vandenberg. You can see the conference table in the background. In 1946 was also the year that Look Magazine published a profile of Vandenberg, and there's a couple of paragraphs in there that I can't resist sharing that, that get at some aspects of his influence. Every few months, wrote Look, several million people become grateful to Vandenberg for expressing their vague thoughts, such as, what is Russia up to? <laughs> and in fact, in October of 1945, he gives a speech on the floor of the Senate called Raise the Iron Curtain. And he was very proud of that speech, and as senators did with big speeches, they would print up special stationery for it and send it out to constituents and others. And he gives this speech in September, and, or excuse me, in October, and, and John Foster Dulles gets it and writes back to him and says, um, great speech, too bad nobody heard it. Because it happened to be the same week that Eisenhower returns triumphantly from Europe as the commanding general, and, there, and, and, and Truman has some big announcement about the, the future of the, the, the atomic bomb, and so it just didn't get any news. And Dulles says, too bad nobody heard it, but I'm sure the phrasing will catch on. In other words, Iron Curtain. Well, it didn't until six months later in Fulton, Missouri, when Churchill delivers his famous Iron Curtain speech. Churchill had actually used the phrase once in an address to Parliament and once in a letter to Truman. But as best I can tell, Vandenberg was the first person to use it publicly in North America. And poor guy, no credit for coining that phrase. Um, but he was gone. Nego helping negotiate peace treaties through virtually all of the election year of 1946. He returned home having not given any speeches uh, the night before the election and uh, cast his ballot and was reelected. But uh, by then he'd almost become something of an oracle. The, the Look Magazine said, it might take a whirling dervish to follow the pros and cons of Vandenberg's Senate votes over the past 18 years. But Vandenberg has whirled as the American people have whirled, or as one of his fellow senators put it, Van changes his mind about as often as the average American, but slightly earlier. And I think there's sort of an understated hint of genius in that slightly earlier. That means you're not so far out in front that you're a leader without followers, and, and he was no visionary, but he could express and therefore helped shape the temper of the times. And he was a fan of Ralph Waldo Emerson, and Emerson said in his essay, Self-Reliance, speak what you now think in hard words, and tomorrow speak what tomorrow thinks in hard words, though it contradict everything you said today. In other words, you know, be ready to change and willing when the time is right. And that's what Vandenberg was doing and bringing millions of anxious Americans along with him. And I, I was thinking being here in, in in the Nixon library, and you can't help but be um, exposed and reminded of, of Nixon going to China. And Vandenberg had something of the credibility of the reformed sinner as he was uh, able to talk about a, a, a more activist role for the U.S. in the world because he'd been an isolationist for so long and reflecting a, a, 
a tendency of most Americans to want to pull back and concentrate on our own affairs. And so um, he could get away with that and bring public opinion with him, maybe a little bit like Nixon could in going to China. The, and that made a big difference when Truman asked for support of the Truman Doctrine, calling for the U.S. to help nations threatened by communist subversion. More specifically, he was supporting Truman when the president asked Americans to pick up the baton from the impoverished British and the governments of Greece and Turkey to resist Soviet pressure. He also became president pro tem of the Senate in, with, with that Republicans regaining a majority in 1946. And um, that meant extra time presiding over the Senate and presumably a lot of dull oratory. And so he would do these elaborate doodles. And I don't have psychological training, but it has to be the work of a very tidy mind. But they were just incredibly elaborate. In fact, as a young congressman, LBJ picked one up, maybe after that joint session of Congress, because he'd leave them lying around and, and had one framed in his office for the rest of his senatorial career. But that willingness to, um, to pull people with him also made all the difference when Secretary of State George Marshall proposed an unprecedented aid program to help the European democracies rebuild their shattered economies. Truman had the political sense to call this the Marshall Plan after the revered general. Marshall himself said it could have been called the Vandenberg Plan because he reflected when it went to Congress, Van was just the whole show. And he was a center of attention at the Republican convention in 1948 as well, when it looked like whoever ran would beat Harry Truman. And this is Rittenhouse Square in Philadelphia with the, the press around Arthur and Hazel Vandenberg. He did not campaign, however, and Thomas Dewey became the nominee. And meanwhile, Americans were learning that rebuilding European economies was not enough. There was also the power vacuum left by the war and now being filled in Eastern Europe by the Soviet Red Army. And the war wrecked Western democracies formed a European Union for mutual defense and invited the Americans to join. Now this was the big one, an entangling alliance which Van had once so adamantly resisted. The Vandenberg Resolution, one page which he typed out himself, enabled American entry into the new North Atlantic Treaty Organization and it sailed through Congress with Vandenberg's leadership. And it was also based on what he had carved out of in, in the language he had, he had made sure was inserted in the UN Charter to allow a mutual defense treaty in the Americas with, to win the votes of the Latin Americans. Um, that actually became the jumping off point to create NATO within the context of the United Nations. And these bipartisan majorities were his pride and joy. This is the Foreign Relations Committee on the left and Marshall's successor as Secretary of State, Dean Acheson, on the right. Uh, but those bipartisan majorities began to fray about the time he was diagnosed in 1949 with lung cancer. After fighting fellow Republicans in the House to secure funding for NATO military aid, he was flown to Ann Arbor for an operation that remo removed half of his left lung. As Mao and the communists emerged victorious in China, Vandenberg was headed back to the house in Grand Rapids that he'd built as a young editor in 1907. As he lay dying, he cherished the chatty notes he received from General Marshall, who reminisced about the days when Marshall's undersecretary, Robert Lovett, came by the Vandenberg apartment to flesh out NATO and other significant initiatives. It would have been a great relaxer to sit down and have a drink with you and Bob Lovett and decide just how we were going to manage the world and then have done it, Marshall wrote. And Vandenberg replied, those were truly great days. Looking backward, it is really quite amazing how well we and the world got along together. But times were already changing. Not only had bipartisanship suffered amid recriminations over who lost China, but a young Republican senator from Wisconsin named McCarthy was fomenting fear with wild accusations of communists in the Truman administration. And war had broken out in Korea. The bipartisan bonds were coming apart and Vandenberg was not there to patch them up. And that brings us full circle. When Vandenberg died in 1951, his slide into relative obscurity began. 
News of his death was overshadowed by General Douglas MacArthur's address to a joint session of Congress. The general, so recently relieved of his command by President Truman, ended his speech with a line about how old soldiers never die, they just fade away. But the eulogies began to pour in. With bipartisanship giving way to the McCarthy era and increasing polarization, journalist Edward R. Murrow paid tribute to Vandenberg for his CBS radio audience with words that I'll, I'll end with this evening. We are now divided, bitterly, hysterically, Murrow observed, noting of Arthur Vandenberg. Had he lived, he would have gloried in this conflict and steadied it. And he would have been confident that at the end of the day, little men of loud voice and small faith will yield to the collective judgment of the American people. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hank. <laughs> Hank Myers agreed to answer your questions, but I first want to announce that uh, his book, Arthur Vandenberg, is available for purchase in the museum store, and uh, Hank will be in the lobby to answer your questions. I'd like to start off by asking, um, President Trump is often um, complained about um, the efforts, uh, too, many, too many fiscal commitments abroad to foreign countries. How do you think Arthur Vandenberg uh, would feel, based on his own era, um, about the US fiscal commitments, even with all the, um, the Marshall Plan and NATO? Was he pretty measured in terms of how much uh, US Treasury was committed abroad? Definitely. He was trying to find a compromise. He was a little bit of a deficit hawk, but he would, his, his part of his skill was understanding what he could sell to the Congress and to the American people. So, um, you know, the Marshall Plan, the genius of the Marshall Plan was that they, the, that we didn't tell the Europeans what to do. We invited them to come up with a list of their needs and how we could help with them. And of course, that comes out to you know, $25 billion in, in 1948 money or whatever it was. And the State Department refines that and winnows it down, but still comes with um, upwards of $20 billion and over several years. And Vandenberg says, no, you can, Van Vandenberg is trying to find a compromise between the administration's request and what he knows his his colleague Robert Taft and the real deficit hawks in the Republican Party are going to accept. And so he's trying to get something that will be substantial enough to make it work, but within, but still something he can sell to the American people and to the Congress. And winnowing that down, making it a year by year appropriation, uh, he was very conscious of the cost of those commitments. But his animating idea the sort of the, the, the mantra, the, his mantra would be our enlightened self-interest. And so he viewed that those investments as, as basically not, not giveaways to other countries, but investments in our security, because if our allies are stronger, we're going to be stronger. And that, that ultimately would have tipped the balance for him. We have a question right here. Convenient. Uh, I, I was wondering if I could go back to the, the subtitle of, uh, of Trail of a Tradition, which is that nationalism is a bulwark of American independence. And, and given um, the shift that you've seen Vandenberg take during his political career from isolationism to a full supporter of the UN, um, how has his, his definition of nationalism changed in those times to given to what we've um, potentially seen today? Well, it might have been political semantics, but he would have said, well, nationalism, we, we as, as Americans, and they brought along a couple of old Time magazine covers here, and one of them is um, around the time of the uh, Truman Doctrine, is we either take or surrender leadership. And so he saw that there was no, that there was no al satisfactory alternative to American leadership. And so nationalism meant that that we become engaged internationally as opposed to being internationalism somehow for its own sake. So it might be political semantics, but he saw that as, as um, if isolationism isn't nationalistic if it's in the national interest to be more engaged. And I think that would have been the way he would have viewed that. And, and, and so yeah, nationalism is an interesting word today. Um, I, I, I keep thinking that, that, uh, that, that there's... In, that, that one of the, the healing ideas we could have as a country would be discovered to discover a new nationalism, but 
uh, Teddy Roosevelt already used that phrase, applying it to domestic policy uh, 110 years ago. So um, I don't know if we can bring that back, but it's a, it might be a nice compromise between America first and what's viewed as, as you know, just sort of willy-nilly international engagement. We have a question right here. If Vandenberg were alive today, how do you think he'd view the tension between, that we see between nationalism and globalism? Well, he, he, of course, lived with that t tension and was on both sides of it. So you, you would have stripped it back to say, well, if, if, of course our NATO allies should pay more, but it's really important to have these allies. And, uh, and so I, I think he would, have, he would have argued for an American that, that, that it will, again, I'm, it, that it was in America's self-interest to have world organizations and, and structures that we could influence and, and that, that we could help shape and define. And so don't, if, if we abdicate that responsibility, other people are going to, are going to make those determinations. So, um, you know, he was, he came out of a Republican party that believed in, in tariffs. He wasn't, you know, he didn't have a history as a free trader, but he saw the, the common market as, as important for the thriving of the American economy in the sense that it was creating trading partners who, who we needed to have in a, if we were to grow. And so, so I'm thinking that maybe, I mean, I'm just winging it here, but the, 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 the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, you know, the argument for that was, sure, it's a multilateral trade agreement. We might not be getting everything we like, but if we're in it and we're the dominant player in it, then we set the tone for trade as opposed to saying, no, we don't want anything to do with it, and then the Chinese try to occupy that position. And so I think he would have, he would have continually pushed to say, um, where, where do we deploy American leadership in ways that are peaceful and help the economy grow, that you know, that's a cheaper investment than, what, than the alternatives. We have a question right here. No, I just wanted to know if he was a smoker or not. He, he was a cig inveterate cigar smoker. Uh, there's a statue of him in Grand Rapids, and it, it has him, sort of like Churchill with a cigar, it has him smoking a cigar. He, he, was, uh, he was always uh, bumming matches off people, and um, I, there must have, there's a halo of smoke around him in this portrait that I think is, reflects reality. Thank you, Hank. Please give Hank Meyer a round of applause. Oh, thank you. Again, Arthur Vandenberg is available for purchase in the museum store. Uh, please meet Hank out in the lobby for your signing. Thank you so much.